Greetings from Stanford University. I'm Bill Barnett, professor at the Stanford Door School of Sustainability and the Stanford Graduate School of Business. And I'm Charlotte Kramer, a student at Stanford. And we have uh, with us here today, Professor Dror Etzion from the University of Vermont and Professor Tarun Khanna from the Harvard Business School. And uh, uh, Dror, uh, Tarun, uh, uh, Charlotte and I were all today at this conference on organizations and environmental sustainability. The second year in a row we've run this conference and two days of really fascinating papers. Uh, let's go to you first, Charlotte. You were at the conference. Uh, what were your takeaways? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think going into it, I was really confused. Like organizations, okay. Like what kind of organizations? Every organization under the sun. And I think that's really what we did kind of see at this conference. We were talking from anything from cement companies to local entrepreneurs to low income houses. We really talked about the organizations that I think are left out of the climate con conservation so often. And I enjoyed the discussion on microclimates as well, and sort of seeing how individuals on a much smaller level can be directly impacted by the effects of climate change. Well, that's interesting. You know, and, and from your first comment there, uh, Charlotte, on organizations, you know, it is interesting how so many discussions of sustainability either go down to the level of individual human behavior, you, you know, what's my carbon footprint, how do I behave, or they jump all the way up to the level of broad policy and society and economy. And as you just said, folks who study organizations are the in-between. And by their nature, they, they study all, all sorts of, of uh, organizations. Yeah, and I think definitely we saw also in the conference some uh, more typical for-profit business companies and uh, a topic that came up which uh, would cause me to think a lot was around the business case for sustainability because kind of the intuitive feel is that we want organizations to be involved in this. There, there has to be a monetary incentive to it. And then we had some people who were saying, well, maybe that's not the main thing. Maybe uh, that's a, a bit too simplistic and there's other ways in which organizations might find purpose or find rationales for going uh, in that direction. And Tarun, I think, has, has, has thought about that issue as well. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm acutely uh, uh, acutely conscious of the, the context within which the organization is situated, right? So most, as you know, most of my work is in developing countries. You reference the work on microclimate. Um, and it's really important to be cognizant of what is the setting from which we're trying to learn something and infer something. And then, apropos your comment about such a wide range of organizations, for us to be able to take the insights from one study and apply them to another, you need to sort of have some, I don't know, some ability to abstract maybe and say, well, this is this is what makes those lessons applicable to somewhere else, or this is what doesn't make them applicable to somewhere else. And I really found myself having fun playing with the different ideas, playing with the diff different levels of aggregation, the individual incentives, the organizations, the national policy, the regulations. It was just like a, I don't know, like a smorgasbord of stimuli in some ways, which I really had a blast with. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, you know, uh, 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 Dror, you uh, uh, were part of one of yesterday's sessions all about data. And um, there were a number of, th of things in the data session that I found to be really striking. But I wanted to come back to you on that because you've been working on that. What were your takeaways from that session? Well, that session, and I think we saw it throughout, you know, we just mentioned the, the body sensor data, millions of data points about people in, in very hot environments and how that influences them. Uh, today we had, a, I think it was a 50 million data point um, set uh, about housing and energy efficiency data in Georgia. Uh, and we're just seeing the emergence of really vast, uh, well done, high quality, free often uh, data sets that allow us to see so much more, to analyze uh, trends better, to understand what are the ways in which we can make uh, progress on these issues. So I'm very optimistic in terms of what uh, increasingly our ability to collect, synthesize, understand, and analyze data is going to allow researchers and others, I think anybody basically in the world, to, to help us make progress on these issues of sustainability. Can, can I come back to you on that? Maybe push back a little bit, Dror. I can imagine somebody at home listening to us say this saying, well, these researchers, they really love their data, but what are we getting out of this? Like, what is the payoff in terms of understanding sustainability? 
Well, I think, I mean, this is the typical academic answer. If you don't have good data underlying uh, some uh, suggestions that you make to policymakers or to businesses how to run their business, then the advice that you give is not very good. Now, of course, uh, there's other ways to impel or motivate people to make decisions. I do believe that some kind of pretty solid understanding of maybe a few alternatives, we try this, it doesn't work as well as that, is a good thing for us to do and a, a way for us to contribute to people. I don't think it's always grounded in data, but I think, you know, for people who use it well and, and have good intentions, it is actually quite okay, a valuable. Okay, okay. That's a good point. Okay. That I take that as a that's a good answer. It's about the decisions that uh, that people make in terms of businesses. Now, uh, coming back to you, Tarun, there was a, 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 a paper yesterday in that data session that was really focusing in on the consequences to human health of heat. And boy, data made a huge difference there in a way I, I was really impressed by. Yeah, you know, th that's a paper where I think we can see very clearly an answer to your question, Bill, which is without the data, you, you literally don't know when to tell the informal worker in a very hot environment in that study setting in India when he or she should stay home to avoid heat exposure, which in turn causes, I really love that the presenter went all the way into medicine and found some really uh, hard hitting, uh, no pun intended, um, medical output variables that social scientists don't normally look at, but to say that, look, if you expose somebody to excess heat uh, or what we call wet bulb temperatures, uh, and there is no intermediating organizational structure to shelter that poor person from the heat, well, you get kidney failure. Um, so there's a consequence, Bill. It's pretty dramatic and pretty pretty direct. And then going all the way to the other extreme, the paper that we saw today uh, that Dror also referenced on, on uh, rural Georgia, uh, the idea that a national level policy um, could trigger such important adaptation effects uh, through these so-called block grants that are a way in the United States to decentralize the allocation of monetary resources as opposed to have some centralized PUBA uh, deciding how to, how to use the money. Uh, that's pretty cool. That's data in action in some ways. So I, I like you, I love the panel that uh, Dror was part of also. Yeah, you know, I, I, it makes me smile to hear this conversation uh, because uh, so actionable the to the point you just made drawer on business decisions being driven by knowing things and same with with your point then Tarun on understanding the impact on human health because we actually measure things and it takes me back to when I met you Charlotte it was uh, last year if I remember right uh, and I was your professor in the introductory course on sustainability. And um, yeah, for those uh, listeners, um, if you can imagine when you were a freshman, if you took a course on sustainability that touched on all the heavy issues, basically the 19 sessions that you really ought to know about, but it can be tough. And I think we were at about week five in a 10 week quarter and you came up to me and said, Professor Barnett, I really need some good news, right? I mean, I, I remember exactly your words, but it was kind of, uh, do you remember this? I do. I'll never forget it. <laughs> <laughs> does this conference help a little? And you can say no. I just want to know. How does this conference then? <laughs> I think it's actually, for me, it's really funny that you brought that up because I was thinking that exactly during this conference. I was like, oh, my God, all this data. We're learning so much. But like, what are we doing? Because for me, the way that I see it, and I work with a lot of data all the time, I study computer science here, I, I think it's very easy to organize data. I've done it before, I know how to do it. And for me, I, I know data, but then when I look to see what the world is doing and what you know, real life organizations are doing, if it's not done through sort of a capitalist, self-motivating price mechanism, it really isn't done. So when we talk about data in microclimates, I was like, OK, but who's doing it? Who's looking out for the little guys? So, sure, we have so much information on how these people are like dying of heat stroke and struggling in these conditions. And now we know and it's great that we know. But what are we doing? I see. I see. Yeah, go ahead. Tarun. 
Charlotte, I thought you would say after Susan's keynote this morning, when she spelled out all the uh, doom and gloom in Charleston. Uh, and, and of course, by Susan, uh, Tarun, you mean Susan Crawford uh, from the Harvard Law School, uh, um, where she gave this terrific keynote uh, based on her book, Charleston. Um, a setting which is um, a coastal city in the United States and very low-lying coastal city and uniquely susceptible to pretty small levels of sea level rise that we're almost certain to see in the next decade or two at most, um, juxtaposed with, as you just put it, the little guy really getting messed up because of the racial legacies of how housing policies have played out and the complete and utter inaction in response to blizzards of data that are available. Uh, I thought you were gonna say, Professor Barnett, I'm still, I still need some really good news. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I think, I think we all do. And what makes me so happy to go to these conferences and to be here and to speak with amazing professors such as yourself is that there, there kind of is hope. I remember exactly what I wrote to Bill. I read it often and I was, I was nasty, I think, about the state <laughs> of the world. But I become more and more hopeful, especially when we talk about things like this and when we realize kind of the complexity of organizations and begin to work with that. I think this relates to a theme in the in the conference that came up was the was the issue of adaptation. And I've always had an idea that this is a really a double-edged sword, this word, because on the one hand, we do want to encourage adaptation and we want to make sure that people who need the support and have the ability to escape you know, extreme conditions have a way to do that. And then over a longer term to move their houses to where they need to be so they won't be flooded. And these were all things that came up in the conference. But at the same time, I think we're also adapting in a way that I find very worrisome. As you were saying, where is the outrage? Where is the you know, all of this information is coming at us and, and, and we hear it and we adapt. We kind of just tune it out. And I think that form of adaptation is really quite dangerous. So I'm always curious about what is the right adaptation that we want to encourage versus what is the adaptation that is just leading us to continue to accept this and, and not sure. do enough. Sure. You know, I'll, I'll tell you, the uh, it, it takes me back to the old psychology literature on self-efficacy. Mm -hmm. There are different ways we can make ourselves feel better, right? One way is just to have the news be good, right? So when people come up and say good news, and I know... Uh, uh, with you professors and, and, and uh, Charlotte, as you go on with your career, this will come up. The, the staff often come to me and say, give me some good news. We got to publish some good news. And I always come back to that and say, I'm going to tell you actually what's happening. Okay. I'm going to tell you what's happening, but there are other ways to feel good. There's two other ways. One way is to block and deny, okay, which you're getting at drawer, right? Where we could just tune it out uh, and then, and then feel uh, good because we're simply not accepting it. Obviously, that's not good for the world, not good for us, right? And and the other way is to find a way to take action. So interesting that even in tough times, if humans can do something, they feel better, even though the context is still kind of tough. And in that sense, um, you know, actionable uh, uh, consequences coming or actionable results from our research might be useful. If I may say, I think there's a third way to feel better. Um, especially as a corporation, and that is greenwashing. So one of our papers spoke about this quite in depth about um, how companies who are under ESG pressures and who are being prompted to divest from certain things will divest from unclean, really CO2 emitting plants, but then will sell them to private companies or private equity firms that don't have those same regulations. So, you know, you can imagine the CEO and all of the investees and everything feeling pretty good about themselves when really it doesn't seem like there's been any significant change. That's and again, that sends me to the everything sucks <laughs> mindset. <laughs> I'm gonna, I got to say, Charlotte, that's awesome. And now the next time I give a talk on this topic, I'm going to throw that third one in. And I'll try to cite you uh, when I when I do it. So I'm, I'm struck by Dror's uh, very playful use of the word adaptation. And it just makes me think that, you know, rhetoric is so important. Um, and we saw, we saw uh, traces of that throughout the conference when people were talking about symbolism and framing and how people interpret things. Uh, to me, you know, as somebody uh, starting to get interested in uh, climate change effects on the seven of the eight billion people who don't live in rich, luxurious surroundings. Um, I think very much of 
climate mitigation, which you tend to see people focused on in, you know, the fancy universities in the world, uh, the rich countries, and climate adaptation, uh, which is really the poor rest of the world that just has to deal with the nuisance that's been visited upon them by the rich people <laughs> in some ways. Mm -hmm. But Drawer brings up a very important point that, uh, so I had two thoughts. One, Drawer brings up a very important point that adaptation can be the way that you described it, which is individuals just tuning things out. And the second thing I th thought, which was very cool, I expected when I looked at this conference agenda that, you know, it would mirror the 90-10 the split in the way research dollars are going to climate research, which is 90 for mitigation, 10 for adaptation. But actually, every single paper in here is about adaptation in one form or the other. There's actually nothing on mitigation, which is really interesting. Yes. We didn't set it up that way. We just responded to people's submissions. And I think it has to do, coming back to the organizations issue that Charlotte started us off with, it has to do with the kinds of organizations that have self-selected to participate in this conference. It's very cool, actually. <laughs> so picking up on Tarun's uh, comment on the 90-10 split, a, a number that stuck with me, and I think maybe uh, one of the things that really uh, um, I'll follow up on after the conference is, is somebody mentioned an 80-20 split that I found fascinating, that 20% of the impact on on the world or environmental sustainability is our individual choices, you know, whether we choose to take a flight, whether we choose to take a reusable uh, bag or a straw. And 80% though is structural or systemic, which means things that are kind of baked in that are very hard for us to change where we don't feel that we have that much agency in terms of choosing this or that option better or not. And, and I think organizations, as you mentioned, Charlotte, organizations are a big part of the routines and the, the structures that we live in and that we have to, to change dramatically in order to get to that 80% additional change that could happen in the world. And I was just fascinated by that number and it's something I'm going to take away for, with, for, uh, from this conference with me to, to think about a bit more. So I have a, a, a more selfish self-reflection introspection, which is um, the, uh, the two-day workshop reinforced in me uh, why given a choice between uh, existing in, uh, as an academic in a discipline-based environment and a choice uh, of existing in a phenomenon-based setting, I'd much rather be in the latter. It's not a value judgment, it's a taste function issue. And just being around people who were sort of very interested in climate change and sustainability, whether they were uh, applied math people, economists, sociologists, ethnographers, engineers, lawyers, uh, physicians, uh, it was just very cool. Yeah, I agree. I think for me, what was really most notable about this conference is that not a single sector went untouched. I mean, we were talking about everything under the sun, and it's so comforting to know that really so many academics, so many organizational academics are studying these things and they're finding this data and hopefully they're, you know, giving people advice, giving policymakers new ideas, new ideas for companies on how to, you know, reach these climate goals. And it's comforting. Yeah. Well, thanks to you, Charlotte and Dror and Tarun and to the listeners. Until next time. The Stanford Initiative on Business and Environmental Sustainability podcast series is sponsored by the Stanford Graduate School of Business and the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. Music by Charged Particles. That's Caleb Hutzler, Mike Rock, and John Krosnick.